Happy birthday, hip hop. What's up, Robin? How's it going? It's uh, going well. Yeah, super happy birthday to hip hop. Um, you know, on, on that, like, what? How did we come up with that day? Oh, look at that! This is the plaque photo. How did um, we uh, come up with uh, hip hop's birthday? Uh, what was it based off of? DJ Cool Herc's first party in the Bronx, August eleventh. Back to school God party. Yes, yeah, so that uh, DJ Cool, cool Herc took uh, took. I posted a little cl clip from it, but DJ Cool Herc had was the originator of the break. He found that people danced more during the drum solos and stuff, so he cut all of that other stuff out and just focused on the breaks. and And that was the uh, origination of hip hop. That is too cool, man. I was wondering how that game came to inception because. Uh, a lot of people just talk about, you know, a lot of influences behind hip hop and how it really kind of, it's not just the the records, but really behind that, the blues and rhythm um, that kind of came with it. But yeah, that's interesting. That's so cool. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I thought it was awesome. It's, uh, it's another day to celebrate. It's, um, yeah. it's hip hop. That's what we're about here at the Four Elements podcast too. So yeah, um, and you know what? Nas's album came out just the uh, last week. Was just going to say the same King's <laughs> Disease 2 fire <laughs> album. Yeah, man, pretty incredible. Some nice stories on there, man. Uh, Death Row East, I told you, I thought that was incredible. When I heard that track, it was right away. I was like, all right, let me listen to that one again. That again. So good. And, and again. <laughs> so and again. True. Yeah, I yeah, had that album on repeat. If you're a hip hop fan and you haven't listened, go listen. If you're not really a big hip hop fan, still go have a listen. Um, Lauren yeah. Hill's on there dropping some nice bars, too. It's amazing so. production on that album um, and some legends on there. EPMD2 has uh, M dropping some bars and just mm -hmm. the classic M form, drop some legendary bars on that track. Absolutely, absolutely. And aside from that, it's been two weeks, so I know. we've kind of had a little not really vacation because we've been working hard on other <laughs> things, but uh, um, all is well with uh, with Robin these days. Yeah, man, things have been going well. Um, yeah, last two weeks were really busy. You know, we were talking before we started recording, work's been uh, kind of crazy. Um, but I, I mean, you know, I guess that's work. We just go through our ebbs and flows. Um, this just happens to be a, a time for me that just incredibly, incredibly busy. So the last two weeks, um, e even though we had them off, they were still quite busy, even just thinking about work and getting things organized. How's it been for you? Not too bad, man. It's been busy with, uh, you know, work's work, but been busy getting Ashley's, uh, Ashley and her sister Crystal's helping them get their business going and, and nice. help them build that. So if lap of luxury home services, got to give it a plug. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun working and building that. And then just trying to enjoy what's left of the summer. It's August 11th, man. We're getting to the end, like faster than we want it to happen. And enjoying some good beers end, when man. I can. Yeah, no, it's, it, 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 it's over. It's over, man. Pumpkin beers are out. Pumpkin beers are out. I saw that <laughs> and it was funny because this morning before we left or before Ashley left, she pointed out there was leaves on the ground. I was like, oh man, I looked up and some of the treetop has gone yellow. So, oh, wow. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Hopefully it's the extreme heat, not a sign of the fall coming. That's my <laughs> guess and hope. Yes. I, I think that this heat is crazy. We're, we're in a thunderstorm watch warning right now. I still believe, I believe you got, you, you might be too in Toronto. I don't know. We are. No, yes. we are, man. It looks Severe. a little bit gnarly as I look outside. It looks like it's probably going to hit us hard tonight. Yeah. So maybe a power outage during our, our <laughs> Oh, we'll for that run. yeah, yeah, let's jinx yes. it, right? <laughs> jinx jinx it. Jinx oh, otherwise, it. it's like right on LTE. We're gonna be setting up our phones trying to do the podcast on that. Yeah. Oh, goodness, that would be uh, that'd be interesting if that did happen for sure. No doubt, yeah, no doubt. I don't know, we'll have to see what happens. We'll keep an eye on that. But uh, tonight's guest is gonna be fun from Kitchener. We have Graham Kobayashi joining us from Counterpoint Brewing. Uh, so we had a Rob, Robin and I'll make a little joke a little later about that, but, uh, we had the mixed signals, so to speak a little bit on. Oh, that. it wasn't missing. I just, I just, I, my <laughs> brain hasn't been in the right place and I misread things is what it was. Yeah. So we've got, we've got uh, yeah. some, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about counterpoint brewing. Um, it sounds like they got a really cool, um, story about how they met, uh, the two owners, Graham and his partner and where, where they kind of built into what counterpoint is today. So we'll learn about that and as well, the amazing work they're doing to stay active within the community and create an inclusive space uh, as well. So, you know, we're all about that here at the podcast as well. So we're looking forward to that. Stay tuned and we'll keep you posted on who's coming up next on the Four Elements podcast. Absolutely. Can't wait. Guide. Awesome. Right on. Thank you everybody for joining. 
A uh, huge thank you to uh, Graham uh, Kobayashi from CounterPoint for joining. Did I say that right? You got it. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Graham, for joining us today. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. How are you guys? Doing very well. well. We're hanging in. It's hot as these days in Southern Ontario, as you know. It is, yes. That's got to have an interesting impact on what you do and your business in brewing sometimes as far as the recipes you make, maybe, or... I don't know, maybe not. Is the temperature control harder when it's like this in the building? You know what? It, uh, it just costs a little more. Uh, is it yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the glycol chillers need to run that much more to keep the temperatures down? Yeah, we don't even have glycol systems. What we use is our uh, air conditioning, or our, our, our unit's air conditioning. Uh, oh, wow. Which is nice for working. Yeah. And so we'd, we'd be running it anyways, but you know, it just means it costs a little more in the summer. Uh, we keep it at a reasonable temperature. We don't, we don't overdo it. Um, and we're also in a plaza where we're, you know, the center unit. So really, like, we're, I don't know, it's pretty efficient anyway. So. Sure nice. It works. Uh, hot water, uh, hot weather does help with beer sales. So that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it does cool down or slow down our uh, work chilling. So uh, that's where it takes a little longer to transfer into our fermenter. So. Yeah, no sure. doubt. Eh? So Graham, as we segue into this, why don't you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what got you into brewing? Yeah, for sure. So, um, well, I mean, what got me into brewing was just the love of beer. Uh, you know, I discovered beer, real beer, I guess we could call it, in about 2006 uh, when I was uh, in Scotland. So uh, you know, at home, in college, that kind of thing, you know, I drank the usual, most of course. Uh, all that good stuff, and uh, I traveled to Scotland to work at a uh, distillery there. And while I was there, you know, discovered the corner store had uh, had beer, beer options, and you know, ales and all sorts of good stuff. So um, that was really just sort of like the, the entry point, and and then um, from there, came home and, and just started digging at the liquor store, trying to find what was new. So uh, you know, early beer stories, and then from there. Uh, I learned to homebrew. So, um, you know, my, my grandmother, uh, bless her heart, she got me a homebrew kit, you know, with, with uh, syrup and, and all. So <laughs> that's so awesome. Extracted with, you know, hops already, uh, already inserted. So that was the easiest thing I, I had ever brewed, but it was probably the grossest. Uh, <laughs> but it got me, you know, intrigued and the process was really exciting. And so I started doing, you know, extract uh, brewing and then you know it's all grain and uh from there it was just uh, a matter of it was just a hobby and so for years i just brewed uh you know on the, on the weekends uh, when i had a few hours and, and, uh, and so that's that's what got me into it just out of curiosity when you were first brewing what kind of beers were you brewing i was brewing uh the weirdest beers i could think of uh <laughs> <laughs> thing to overdo it, overcomplicate it, but also just try and be super outrageous because you can, right? So, yeah. You know, I love variety of flavors and all sorts of things. So, but I mean, I you know I did some some uh, crazy beers like a like a I call it the what you talk about because it was like a taco inspired beer, supposed mm. to be everybody used chili powders and a real chilies. And it was just like human overload. <laughs> it was not good. Some friends loved it, but I you know I don't know. Oh, it sounds like I would love something like that. I, I love some heavy spice in my beers. I mean, I'm okay with that. I'd be the guy sending it over here. I'll take it. Yeah, and some other stuff like mango or uh, cherry season, so, which was a little much more palatable. Nice. What, nice. Where, and how do you go from, you know, first you're saying you're working at a distillery and trying these incredible beers overseas, coming back with this passion and love for that, starting your home brewing, starting to really experiment quite a bit. How do you go from that to then starting the brewery? Oh, uh, I think it always starts with a silly idea, um, <laughs> a good idea to do, to start a brewery. Uh, so, uh, with um, initially started with a few guys, and, and um, uh, that we started a brewery. We all had sort of ideas, and, and uh, it was all in line. But as it happens, um, you know, a few of them were sort of sidetracked with other ideas or investments and that kind of thing, and and uh, just decided that. Uh, I had momentum and I, and I was excited about it. So, uh, you know, I, I started it with um, uh, a partner at the time and we just, yeah, we went for it. So 
Um, it, you know, in this case, it's much smaller than what it would have been with say four, four people, but uh, it turned out, I wouldn't have, yeah, wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, it turned out to be, you know, perfect for CounterPoint. But really sound, sound, uh, sounds like you're like, you know, what doing what most of us want to do is, is work for your work with your passion or, or, you know, invest your passion in your work and vice versa. And when you can have your passion as your work, it's so much easier to be more passionate about what you put in and listening to these amazing recipes you talk about, even from your home brewing days and stuff. I can just imagine the stuff you get to now allow yourself to come up with and the zany ideas you can have being the, you know, being a, a business owner and a brewer and, and, you know, coming up with some great ideas and beers, like the one that, you know, we were going to have first be uh, more like a Friday, which is focusing on using on a hundred percent Ontario ingredients. Cheers. Yes. Um, so I, I just think it's really cool that you, you know, you get to do what you love and then you get to create amazing things and, and have like amazing collaborations too. And meet amazing people doing it. Sounds wonderful. It's, it's, yeah, it was a huge opportunity and you know, it was, it was of course very scary, but, uh, at the time and, and uh, but yeah, glad I went through with it. And like you say, it opened doors to so many other, um, aspects of, of the passion of, of beer itself which which was cool like you know the community is, is the main one and yeah, collaborations like the one we did here with uh with ren navarro beer diversity for cheers uh, to ren support a gal and, and their efforts um and also even just the fact that this beer also includes yeah just 100 percent of the beer ingredients which is something we're looking into doing a little more of this year as well um but still work and and you know there's a lot of it that isn't that fun, but it's like any business, I think any job, uh, there are ups and downs, but doing these uh, projects um, really reminds you of how, how fun it can be. No doubt. And, and sure. Doing that, do like that, the passion kind of makes the harder stuff easier to deal with too, I would assume, right? You know, you, those ups and downs that you speak of, the downs are tough, but at being that it's your passion, it, I can assume that it makes you want to drive through it a little more, so to speak, and, and continue to push through the tough times, like the recent experience that we've had on businesses in the last 18 months. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the final product itself, you know, sharing it with, with friends or, or you know, our customers, um, yeah, and, and our staff, like, I mean, having a, a team, uh, that's supportive and positive is, is huge, um, as well. So, you know, I'm maybe hiding in the back about the spreadsheets you know in my office and, you know i can come out and, and <laughs> say hi to, say hi to whoever's working and, and you know it's instant like you know a bit of a break and, and definitely a, a boost that's so cool yeah you know, i i had a question because you ryan you kind of touched upon the idea of, of covid and it kind of affecting businesses over the last year um one thing that i've found and not to say that this is the only good thing that came out of covid but one of the good things that did come out of covid was the fact that our beer laws had loosened up a little bit. Um, breweries were a little bit more comfortable in shipping back and forth. And through this process, Graham, did you at all find that uh, it opened your beers up to a, a broader audience of beer enthusiasts? Because normally, if like if it's, you know, some people in the city get stuck in this bubble and they're like, "Well, I'm not going to leave this area or this area," and that's all they try. But did you find it opened it up to those kinds of people as well that might not normally try your beers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we. You know, receive that that huge local support um support local support i guess is, you know kind of a funny term but receive that and really experienced um yeah it was it was eye-opening and heartwarming uh people that would never even probably try beer came by and, and uh said you know we just want to make sure you guys are good we want you to stay here um heard great things about you that kind of thing so that was huge and then even you know we kind of opened up to, you know, some more shipping options. It wasn't huge for us because we um, sometimes have a, have a tough time keeping up with local demand, which was sometimes the case even through COVID. So, uh, but definitely, yeah, non, non beer drinkers or new customers, that kind of thing came through our door and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was great. That even speaks volumes about you folks as a, as a business, because when people are coming in and they're saying we've heard such amazing things about you, and sometimes they're not even beer drinkers or enthusiasts, a lot of times they're there to make sure that you're surviving just because you're helping that community thrive as well, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, that's like I said earlier, it speaks volumes about uh, your business as a whole. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And also the perception of what beer is and, and what a, a small brewery or small business can do for the community, you know. Um, 
independently owned businesses and that and and the realization that they uh, serve a bigger purpose than just in our case serving beer or selling um, hardware um, but yeah the real people own it work there and uh, and it really matters I think a great part of that perception to you know the community comes from the work that your you know brewery is well known for like doing these amazing collabs creating that inclusive space which you know it's um, it's not always easy to understand how, how to go about that, but counterpoint has done an amazing job uh, of doing that. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen it time and time again, these amazing collabs. Um, Ren is, she's awesome. You know, I talked to her from time and time and had her on the cast before and the work she does is amazing. So seeing a uh, brewery like counterpart join into these collabs, it just sets a standard, not only for the community. What's that? Counterpoint. counterpoint <laughs> sorry, Jesus. See? <laughs> I'll edit that out because that's the problem with this. But um, you guys, you know, you you guys, and I'm trying to eliminate that from my terminology too. Um, you and your team are well known for these amazing collabs. So I think that is reciprocal in what you might have, you know, what you're seeing from the community through COVID as well is, you know, they know you through these collaborations. That's how names like Counterpoint get out there. And, and it's not just through selling beer. It is through investing in the community. Yeah, I really um, hope so. Like, I really hope it makes a difference. And, and not that not for the fact that we might get new customers out of it, but for the fact that if people are seeing that, that they're, then they're getting our messages and they're getting um, to know the groups and people that we support. And so hopefully in turn that, you know, they'll support the same causes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And buy this great beer. Um, I'm really enjoying this one. It's uh, I love the idea of showcasing all Ontario ingredients. I think, um, I mean, I, I, we, we all know, I mean, Ontario and Canada in general is quite behind the scene, like America, as far as beer development, um, even, you know, growing hops and stuff. But Ontario is a great, great growth in that area of the industry in the last two to three years, I would say, maybe four years, we're seeing some hop farms open up. Um, so I would like to know a little bit about the choice of ingredients that you use here on this beer and, and why it's important for you to not only work with community, but also to focus on using all Ontario ingredients. Yeah, so many reasons, um, you know, we've, we've started to, to dive into more Ontario uh, ingredients and, and, and products. Uh, the obvious one is, you know, to support local. I mean, we get our local support and how can we do the same for our economy and, and uh, those in, in our industry uh, from our neighborhood. So that is, uh, you know, the, the first one that comes to mind. The other that, you know, is not often I think considered is uh, sustainability. So when we look at you know, uh, climate change, uh, obviously every small thing that we can do to uh, to make it make a difference is important. So um, you know if we stick to this uh, closer radius of, of, of suppliers, then that helps uh, with sustainability and, and also sustainability for our own industry in Ontario craft beer. So uh, environment and business. Uh, a difference and then um yeah it, it was and also just the challenge of, of new ingredients that we haven't really touched uh before um not many are so there's there's not as much to discuss about it with other breweries when we say hey you know like what have you used um uh, have you tried this combination of hops and, and malts and, and yeast and, and uh, you know it's, it's experimental so we're lucky again like our size at our size you know, we try a batch of all ontario we just went right in so and uh, you know, luckily, I guess it, it turned out well. It's it's really enjoyable, and um, and yeah, we hope to do more. So we've incorporated some more. Uh, haven't done another 100%, but a lot of you know 80, 90% malt uh, from Ontario and uh, yeast is generally from our Scarpin Labs anyway. So that's a no-brainer. Yeah, no doubt. They're not too far either from you, are they? Exactly. Yeah, just up the street. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. That's... It must really force you folks to be. Like, I guess always on your feet, if that's the case, when you're sourcing that local, that it's always like, well, I might want to work with a certain ingredient, but that's not available. So I'll kind of work with these ingredients and get more creative with them. So you must have to flex those creative muscles uh, a little bit when you're brewing and you only limited to certain ingredients. Absolutely. Yeah. And we take it all into consideration. I'm, um, our brewer, Justin, is, is very meticulous when it comes to planning recipes. Um, and when it comes to unknowns, you know, it's, it's layer on the side of caution but he's also not afraid to experiment and, and just and roll with it you have to lose you know in this case lose lose a bit of control and uh let the ingredients take over and uh you know figure out what the final product is and and if it's great 
stick with it, but there's always changes to be made as well. For sure. Well, that's that the the constant pursuit of perfection that um, you know we see with breweries. But I, you know, I, I was laughing the other day. I had a, a beer from another brewery. It was a Wizard Wolf, and I was like, you know what? It's. I just thought in my head it was funny how we're always trying as a consumer. You're always trying to align that next sip with that first sip, right? Like you'll it'll never taste the same. So. Um, I love that your, you know, your team and your brewery team as well is always looking at like that perfection and constantly that pursuit of perfection. Don't just stop when it's good, like looking at ways to evolve it, whether it's a slight change in the water, um, softness and things like that. And um, I think it's interesting as a consumer, we forget that that first beer is generally like that's the first beer. And after that, it typically ideally should get better because you're perfecting these different variables. So it's a, I thought it was a funny, funny thought for myself, actually, not really a question. It's, it's an interesting dynamic from yeah, the brewer to the consumer. What is, you know, again, perfection? Are we going for the biggest, juiciest IPA that's going to get five stars on tap? Or are we going for something, <laughs> more, you know, a little finer, a little more meaningful uh, that is still, you know, well-made and a and, uh, fine result, but, you know, maybe not the banger that, that everybody's going to look for. But exactly. Yeah, out. it's... Well, that's, it's, uh, it showcases in your selection of styles, like, you know, even with the variety that you send. And thanks again for that awesome package. Um, the, you know, it just, it showcases that you're, you're not focused on just those bangers or whatever, whatever is, is the style right now. And, and let's be honest, there are some great, you know, hazy IPAs are great. Um, but there's, uh, there are other great beers out there too. And you've got these uh, loggers that, uh, that you're doing and, and Saison's as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's nice to see that there's an, there's an alternative option? And is that something that is a kind of a commitment that you have both as a beer lover and a business owner? Yes, absolutely. Um, something, I mean, it really, I think it really stems from the fact that I love variety. Uh, I get bored uh, easily. Um, and so when I go into a brewery or a, a bar or something like that, and, and you know, I like to see what they have, and, and my chances are my first beer is not going to be the same one as my second beer have a few beers here mm -hmm. i really want to check them out see what's going on and what, what the uh, options are so and then again as well from from the side of manufacturing the beer right i mean uh to plan it out and execute it is uh it's just the same thing over again uh, it's also it's not not as engaging so um want to try and keep it fun and uh and, and uh, explore so uh and then the variety again of, of styles i think it's really a great way to show what you can do um, as a brewer to uh, be able to make, you know, uh, a few different styles. Um, even if you have one preference or one that you can really master, I think, you know, playing around with the others, um, yeah, it keep, keeps it fun, but also showcases uh, your abilities. But gets more people like to have an opportunity to try something too, right? Somebody yeah. is not a hazy beer lover, then there's an opportunity and they have something different to try. And I think that's also you know, an important part too of the consumer component is variety as well. I, I'm the same as you, I would, there's, I would never, especially this place I've never visited, I would never have that same beer twice. Like that wouldn't even, it wouldn't even make sense to me. Even if it was five star untapped, I don't untapped rated, I don't do untapped. I'm still a beer advocate guy. I'm kind of aging myself maybe a bit there. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I'd, I'm the same. If there's, you know, if there's a dunkle on tap or something, like I'm probably going to reach for that first because rarely do you see a dunkle on tap. So, you know, I want to, I'm so excited to see other styles and, and, you know, other varieties hopefully come back too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, last year, I think, or in the year before, the, uh, the crispy styles were, were making a comeback, and, and it's great to see that craft lager is, is, is an option. Um, so for us, we, you know, we started to play around a bit with uh, Scarpman's uh, crispy kvike strain, and, and uh, yeah. it allows us, without the glycol system, it allows us to make crisp, uh, uh, clean beers. Um, so we, you know, we did a uh, yeah, we did a for real though. Uh, for real though, quite lager, and, and then the power out fills that you've got is a uh, you know quite fills so style beer. So uh, you know dry up I don't know seven. So you get to play around with it, keep it light, keep it crisp, and fresh, and still uh, play around with some hops. I can't really read it. Dry hop. That's the power out fills. Nice. So Kvike, Kvik, uh, one of these the. Uh, most disputed, I don't know, I can't say it right, but it's disputed on our show anyways. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a great use. So is is it um, something that uh, you your team is planning to use maybe for other styles as well? Is that something you have used for other styles, or is it something you're just using for your pills and logger series right now? Yeah, for now this one uh, is the only one we're using. Uh, we also enjoy using uh, Verdant yeast and, and Foggy uh, from the Scarment, um, and then the recent one, Saison Maison, is the. It's, it's, we've used it before, but we've just brought it back in to allow us to make some some great Saison beers. So, um, yeah, we try to keep it variety. I mean, it, again, it's variety and the yeast, which I think is probably one of those overlooked. Uh, ingredients um, from from a consumer point of view, I think it 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 may not uh, they may not be aware of it, but it, you know makes a big difference. So we, you know even making the same beer, we've we've uh, divided them up and and uh, and uh, used two different yeasts just to experiment to see which one we like more and which one has has the right effect. That's so wild. Now, like in itself, uh, we're going to be um, experimenting a little more with it as well. So I think yeah, I think it serves a great purpose. I think it's got some uh, some great potential. Uh, it's one that has gotten away on us before. It's it's just a it's a pretty intense yeast, but well maintained, and it, it it definitely plays a big role and gives a lot of great character to uh, some some fine beers. I was going to say, besides that incredible beer that you folks are trying there, which unfortunately I'm not, what are some of the uh, beers that people can expect to be able to try when they come to your brewery? Like, do you folks at Counterpoint have any core beers? Like, because now when we're talking about this evolution and talking about always kind of trying something different, you folks now have core beers because it would make it a little bit more difficult, it would seem, working with ingredients that are harder to get sometimes to actually have something like that. Yeah, for sure. We've never really had core beers. Uh, we have a line of uh, pale ales that we call Duet. And that one, uh, it's made a pretty good pretty good impact on, on our customers. Um, uh, we, we're on Duet 21, which we're releasing this week. Wow! So it's a series of beer uh, of pale ales that, that uh, essentially the, the you know main recipes remain the same, but we have paired up a duet of new hops with uh, with every batch. So uh, this oh, one nice. is Comet and Equinot, uh, and um, really really nice, really nice work. That's one we we try to do uh, quite often and continue that series. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, other than that, we've done a few repeats, but, uh, no, uh, no flagships or, or steady beers, but you can always expect, uh, you know, a big IPA, a pale ale of sorts, um, usually a saison and, and something dark, uh, nice. even for the summer, we, you know, we have our, our song circle Porter, which we've done a few times, uh, nice old gauge Porter and it's, uh, just solid. It's nice to have that option even in the summer, uh, that's amazing. It's almost like a farm to table restaurant. <laughs> you know, you certain times you you go there and you're like, Oh, I tried this amazing dish. You go there and you're like, Oh, there's another amazing dish. <laughs> they don't have what I had before, but now they have something even more amazing here. So it's always, it seemed like so exciting for your customers to come by counterpoint and being like, wow, there's all this fun stuff always. That's kind of rotating here. That's amazing. Yeah. We're lucky they've embraced it. Uh, you know, initially, um, you know, we have that question, well, what do you, you know, what's your beer, what's your flagship? And, you know, you can kind of tell like, if, if it's a new person, a new customer, because they'll ask that or, or uh, but, but anybody who's been in before, like, okay, what's new this week? So, you know, what do you have? Well, we've already had that. I don't want that. So, um, but people do have their favorites too. And, and they'll, you know, throw in some requests for, Hey, will you, know, will you brew a uh, big brass again? And, and uh, hmm. Oh, know, that's so fun. It's cool. So, you know, we get enough of that and we'll, we'll do it again. Cause you know, we enjoyed it too. Now you folks have like incredible seasonals. Well, not seasonals, but amazing beers that like come and go. Uh, one thing I got to ask you, because you mentioned about working in a distillery at one point, point in time. And one thing that's become incredibly popular is barrel aged beers. You've been seeing them as the years have gone on more and more every single year. Now, did you bring anything that you learned from working in the distillery over to the brewing industry at all? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even just the fact that, uh, you know, you lose lose all control when you put something in a barrel. <laughs> uh, so that was probably, you know, lesson number one that, that I acquired. Um, also just, you know, sort of patience and, and, you know, the things are ready uh, when, when they say they are, you, you really don't uh, decide that, that the beer itself or the spirit and, you know, in the case of, of whiskey um, decides for you. So, um, you know, that's huge. And then also, my experience with spirits and, and, and whiskey in particular, 
is great. Um, it's a great uh, knowledge base for uh, for blending both worlds, uh, so that you you kind of have an idea of, of what's going to come out and, and what type of spirit will work well with what kind of beer. That's nice. too cool. Yeah, it's really fun. Tar patience is is something learned, and it sounds like you learned that through that industry, and we're able to bring it right through here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, my stint, you know, my stint there in, in the distillery was fairly short, uh, but. Yeah, it was, it was definitely education. And one thing that doesn't always require patience necessarily, I think we were having this one next, was it the Power Out Pills? Yeah, yeah. And so we were talking a little bit about Kavike East, and so yeah, we we're going to have the, the Dry Hop Pilsner Power Out Pills. So this one, the they're interesting. They don't require as much patience, do they, when you're messing around with this yeast? Correct, yeah. The Kavike is usually a very fast-acting uh, yeast, ferments within you know, a few days. The majority anyways, you know, it finishes off uh, its tail end. It's a little slower, but yeah, you see, I mean, even, I, I gotta say, I mean, we do double batches for our brew days and, and, you know, we'll brew the first half, pitch it, pitch the yeast. And by the time the uh, second half is going in the tank, it's, it's fermenting. We can see, we can see it going on. So mm. cheers. It's a bit crazy. So this see. beer, it's got an interesting name and an interesting story, doesn't it, Graham? You folks are brewing this beer something went out like the power went out and hence the name the power out pills how did that end up affecting the beer <laughs> did it affect it at all clearly not overly creative name here but uh, it's just <laughs> too too good to, too good to miss the opportunity so yeah this one i mean we were really at the tail end uh we're about to cast out and, and uh, knock it out into the fermenter power went out so we had to just we, we sat on it for a bit and, and just decided it wasn't coming back on until something like five in the morning, according to Hydro. Jeez. So we decided to seal it up and, and uh, call it a night. So, uh, you know, the, the risk was there, risk of contamination or, uh, yeah, things going wrong based, based on the hops. But because it was a very lightly hopped beer, um, there it turned out okay it was probably a little more bitter than, than anticipated but and i think it worked in our favor in this case and uh made a bit of a, a statement uh and uh yeah you know we and we dry off it lightly just to just to add a touch of flavor but even before that tasting it we're lucky it uh it turned out but yeah again one of those things that you don't plan for and uh what brewing is is all about it seems well, again, it speaks to, you know, how well you work under these circumstances that you still did an incredible job. Ryan, you should have seen his expression when he tried to sip of that. He obviously loved it. Yeah, Siskel and Ebert's got two thumbs up on this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of the return, like you said earlier, the return of the pills and the lagers, um, seeing these crispies return. This is beautiful. It's a very, very nice beer. You can get it's almost got a slight, almost Italian feel to it, which is, it's got that little bit of floral dry hop to it. I, I find it's really, really nice. And I love um, what breweries are doing. And I don't know if it's intentional um, or it's, you know, something that you, your, your team planned, but we're seeing kind of these floral um, lagers and pilsners, the Italian style specifically, um, that kind of, they're not, they don't border, but they definitely bring the hazy drinker kind of back into the world of Krispies or into the world of Krispies for the first time. I can imagine for somebody who's never really started out like we did drinking, um, you know, all of the lagers and pilsners we could find. Um, is that, is that a, an intentional move to kind of maybe capture a bit of a market that's transitioning or is this, you know, is that something that uh, it just happened to be so beautifully floral as it came out? Uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely wanted some, some character that set it, a, set it apart from just a classic, you know, say that, uh, you know, classic lager or even our other, you know, like lager for real though, um, you know, which is pretty straightforward. So yeah, something to set it apart and yet, uh, keep it crisp, clean and give it some, some, uh, some more character that, that might, that those who enjoy hops and hop, uh, hop flavors and aromas would it, would, uh, enjoy just enough yeah because i'm i'm, I'm a, I, I love a good bready pilsner where you're just lean and heavy and a bit of the noble on it but really heavy on the uh, on the grains and but this i really find has that it, it leans more to the floral to but not enough you still get those grains and, and that nice uh you know grass character um as a saskatchewan 
you know, I love Saskatchewan. And so I always love drinking Pilsners and, and lagers because I get some of that. I always feel like I'm in a field of, of yeah. Saskatchewan, just eating dry hay or something sometimes, you know, wheat right <laughs> off the ground. Yeah. Beautiful. This is great. Robin, I can't wait for you to get yours, man. You're going to love these. I know. I'm so excited. I'm seeing the color of them. I'm seeing the look on your face and I'm just thinking they look so good. Oh my goodness. And especially, I think the way the, you know, you know, especially not even the beer drinker, but for myself and, and maybe for those of us on the call, cause I think we're probably all in the same vicinity of, of aging. Um, it's harder to drink hazy beers as we get older too, as you, you want to, you know, maybe they taste great, but it's hard to have a couple of hazy beers on the old body these days. So having amazingly, you know, amazing tasting pilsners and lagers to turn to is, is good for the body too, I guess. Maybe we can do a body break commercial about it. <laughs> Just focus on health today. That's right. <laughs> choose healthy, choose Pilsners. <laughs> love it. I love it. It is true though. Me and Ryan talk about this. Like, you know, we, I think that, you know, when we started drinking beers, we're, we kind of transitioned after a period of time over to IPAs and there were West Coast IPAs at the time. They're really heavy IBU, super malty, delicious beers, but just West Coast IPAs. And then transitioning over to East Coast IPAs, then milkshake IPAs. Every single ad just feels like, oh, this is kind of, a, it's a delicious, but it's a heavy beer. Like I can, I can drink one of these and it feels like I don't need to eat a meal. Like it feels like I've ate something. And now coming back to beers like this that are so fresh, crisp, and, and like you were saying, the, the crispy boys coming back throughout last year, it was nice to see just lighter beers and not necessarily light alcohol, but easier drinking beers that didn't weigh you down as much as a, a lactose IPA might. Yeah, for sure. And the more people that get on board, the more breweries that decide to make it, you know, the more variety again, which I think is better again for the consumer, you know, for crappier lovers, and also to bring you back to those styles. You know, if if you don't like one brewery's cream ale or or lager, then you can try another, and and you'll probably like that one. So yeah, true. yeah, so true. It's it's just a, it's it's a unique um, opportunity for the consumer again because. Now, when you go back to the shelves, even at the LCBO or your local bottle shop, which is another awesome new opportunity. Um, I, my local guy, he's got, you know, hazies. He's got his dark beers. He's got his crispy boys. He's got, you know, his sours and his saisons and Belgians and international styles. And it's like, that is, that's a dream for me. You know, okay, I want one of these, one of those. It, it, have you found, and I wanted to ask a question about the bottle shops. Have you found that that's opened up another opportunity for you? Because I have, I did actually try one of your beers from our local bottle shop. So have, uh, has that kind of provided an opportunity for you to get your beers out as well, using uh, that as an opportunity? Or yeah, sure. Um, you know, when it seems a big, a big pull to, for, for bottle shops is, is to be able to bring in breweries from out of the area that the, you know, the average consumer can come to us, but they may not travel to Toronto or Barry. Uh, whereas, you know, um, say Mark from Princess Cafe or Sidewalk, Sidewalk Beer Shop, you know, he does all the heavy lifting for everybody and, <laughs> and uh, they have the <laughs> biggest selection, you know, in town, which is great. So, um, yeah, it's been really cool. We, you know, we've sent some more beer out of town um, as far as, uh, you know, Ottawa area, uh, which is pretty sweet for us to, uh, you know, get the love out there and, and also hopefully people enjoy it. And, you know, when, they, when they're in the area, they'll think of us. Bye. Nice. That wouldn't be our friends from Kitchisepi, would it? Their, their, their bottle shop? No, no. No, no. <laughs> I know they, had, they just opened a bottle shop. We had them on and they have a bottle shop. But it's, I think it's such a unique, I mean, for me, it's the same thing. Like you just said, it's, it's a bit of a travel for me from Barry to Kitchener. But if I can go up to Evan's shop and grab a bottle of somebody's beer I can't have, it's unique. And Mark, um, yeah, like he was kind of, he was the first one to really do it. And we, he's just, you know, yeah, he's really kicking ass down there. He's right up the street from you too. He's not too far, is he? That whole area. Yeah. That far, so. <laughs> so as a as a beer drinker and beer consumer, I'm sure you're loving that opportunity as well. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I've heard I've heard his fridge is exquisite. Walking up to it up the street, like he's, he's he said the visual is uh, just it makes you thirsty as you're walking towards it. <laughs> the walk by the walk up window is, is perfect, you know. And, whatever you're in the mood for again like you say you know your your uh, local shops beer fridge is there for you whatever mood you're in what a world though eh like being able to just go up and buy beer and walk out without anybody questioning maybe you might need a bag of chips right. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you might you might need a bag of chips but <laughs> pack of gummy bears bag of chips something leaving that bottle shop chips now, Grant, i've heard of an unbeaten potato so 
Yeah. <laughs> Where's this going here, guys? <laughs> now, Graham, I know that this year, I think you folks celebrated your second anniversary at Counterpoint in February. Obviously, this was during like a, a time where nobody's getting out of the house and you, you can't really even get out if you wanted to because we were in lockdown. Now, are you folks planning on having any sort of a shindig this summer to maybe continue that celebration or re-celebrate that second anniversary? Uh, to be honest, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm torn with, with these things because during this time, you know, we want to promote safety and responsibility. Uh, and yet, you know, our business... Uh, thrives off of people visiting us and, and events and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's the game of patience, uh, especially right now, and, and not just for us, for every brewery and, and, um, and business, I think. So we, I, I'm not planning on any makeup celebration here, but, but we're just trying to keep it safe. We're, you know, we're throwing some food trucks in the mix, uh, you nice. know, out, out, outdoor events and, and outdoor music and that kind of thing to keep it safe, but keep it entertaining. And it's, and it's health, you know, it's, it brings people out. Um, everything is, is you know to code here so we're pretty strict on that and uh keep it that way but you know we'll make up for it hopefully third year anniversary uh, oh heck yes. yeah no that's super responsible of you folks especially with the case numbers the way they've been fluctuating so much you never really know what's going to end up happening and it's, it's really super safe and responsible to be doing something like that good for you yeah folks. and to plan ahead i mean it, it could just be a, a ton of effort mm -hmm. for that's not so true yeah, yeah another cancellation right so yeah just to keep it uh, keep our our mindset healthy and, and uh sane we'll just yeah we'll just we'll just keep it small so so you mentioned you had food trucks so i i'm i'm assuming and and you have like a space out front like you have a patio in the in the area you're in because i know you mentioned you're in kind of like a strip mall kind of thing yeah the good thing is i mean you know for the majority of us uh or the businesses here you know are nine to fives monday to friday so a little flexibility on the weekends um Oh, nice. We've got a you know a little patio in our parking lot. It's very very humble, but it uh, it works. It, you know, uh, people can sit and enjoy beer outside, and, and uh, we've got some shade. So um, yeah, it's been working well for us. You know, we get the food truck parked right there, and it's it's great for them because we're on one of the busiest streets in Kitchener, so good visibility. And, nice. and it brings you know new customers to us, but also our customers get to enjoy beer with with some food, which is something we can't normally provide because we don't have a kitchen here. So. Nice. Yeah. And I, you know, that was a, that was an interesting concept to me from coming from Barry and, and kind of not really being familiar with the greater everywhere else craft beer scene for quite a few years was the idea of even in Toronto or somewhere like taking food and sitting at a patio and then ordering beer. And I was, you know, that was just this like net new concept that I couldn't grasp. I, was, I don't understand how this works. Like, it's really cool that um, another tie into community that I've seen with craft breweries and, and especially with the explosion of craft breweries over the last three, four years, um, we're seeing so many more of these cool collaborations with food trucks um, or other, you know, members of the community, like uh, our friend Lori from All Sauce, um, you know, doing some awesome collaborations with great small businesses. It's just this really um, circular uh, experience of community that the craft beer scene offers which you know we just we just love so i think that's really cool you you even in your small space you're providing that opportunity for another company to to come and, and support them and vice versa it, it works it's reciprocal right absolutely yeah one of my favorite things to have here is you know food pop-ups or, or yeah, food trucks because uh, yeah you get to know uh, other people uh, you get to know uh, new businesses and, and people behind them and it's yeah it's a great collaboration and often enough we get to talk you know, ahead of time to say, hey, what, you know, what do you have on tap? And, uh, you know, what can I make to pair with that? Especially with, you know, Laurie Alsace. Yeah. <laughs> Pro with that. And, and, um, and it's great to work with, yeah, like, like-minded like people, you know, like to be creative. I love it. So I did want to ask, you mentioned about, you know, in this concept of, you know, bringing people in off, like that, in off the street that are new. Have you noticed um, a lot of, because people traveling to breweries hasn't been able to happen as well. Have you had a lot of out of towners that are doing more kind of brewery to brewery stops? Have you noticed? I don't know maybe if you, if you get that opportunity to communicate with many, but is that uh, something you've seen an influx of since we've kind of seen a, a, a loosening of some of the rules? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. And not, not, you know, not too far away. Obviously everybody's still somewhat restricted or, or uh, but yeah, the gates are open and um and people are moving around a little more, so it's, it's been great. We've had people from London, Toronto, uh, you know, up north, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, definitely, it definitely helps. And, and again, it keeps things interesting. And, and um, yeah, you know, as long as they're being 
everything safe and and uh and we're happy to have people people in and exploring i love it yeah. that's it's i'm so glad to be able to do that too just to sit down and have a beer yeah i it mean you get you have people sit in our tap room or on our patio and, and just drink you know on site and uh support from our taps again right it's it's phenomenal so so we, all, we always we always yeah, we always joke sometimes that we have joked a few times with some of the brews we had on about the keg filling and, and how that must have been returning to <laughs> filling of the kegs and, and the experience that that was. Was that, uh, how, how was that? Was that kind of a celebration moment for you and your team when you were getting ready to fill kegs back up or were you kind of like, holy shit, do we remember how to do this? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was great. I mean, you know, to be honest, our system, we fill, we put all our beer in kegs first and then move it to packaging, but yeah, it saved us, it saved us a lot of work, to be honest. <laughs> Not to have to bottle everything or, or, uh, or can everything. And and, um, and then again, it's it's sort of like that, the freshest product that you can, that you can get, right? I mean, it's just, you know, you put it in there and you pull the, pull the lever and, and there you go. Nice, cold glass of beer. Well, this is pretty damn fresh, if you ask me. This is August 4th. <laughs> True <enough>. So <laughs> I think that's also really, you know, when you talk about, you know, being, not having a core you talked earlier at the freshness is one thing that is you you know that you're obviously i don't get to visit your spot but obviously that's one thing that you're well known for because you're constantly circulating beers it's a smaller system you got new recipes always coming through so freshness is a huge factor i think when you, when you can get a pilsner that's i don't even know how many days ago that is my brain's fried seven days like a week, a week ago that's fresh yeah. and i love it bottled and shipped within a week right that, there you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's true and that's you know one thing we we're, we're pretty proud of too is you know we're, we're bottling weekly based on you know, demand so um we have to keep it you know keep it uh, under pressure until until we need to package it and and uh i think it's i think it's important too to for people to know you know when it was when it was put in that package so they can gauge on you know when when they should consume it absolutely and on that note do you have like any window which you tell your your consumers to drink their beers within which after you think that maybe it'll lose a little bit of flavor after this point or that point yeah i mean we usually encourage people to drink it depends on the beer of course you know but ipas you know within, the, within a couple of weeks is what we'll recommend um you know it would be fine for two to three months probably but you know fresh is best as, as the, the slogan goes and um try and keep it that way uh but otherwise you know like some of our our barrel aged stouts are you know still you know still they're ready to drink but you could sit on them for a while and, and totally up to people and tell them to buy a few and, and and they can experiment they can you know hit hit milestones and celebrate with a you know bourbon barrel aged stout and, and see what happens six months later and see how it tastes and, and the evolution of that beer Hey, I think that's a great idea, Ryan. You know I've got a cellar full of beers. So I think that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Instead of wine, big. it's a little too big. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I'd, I'd much rather celebrate any anniversary, birthday, anything with a, a bourbon barrel aid stout than with a bottle of champagne. I just prefer beer over something like that. So I think that's a great idea. Just a different kind of bubbly. Yeah, exactly. Different kind of bubbly. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, you've got a few of those magnums sitting in the bottom of that cellar, oh, too. I know. Jeroboam, even, man. Jeroboam. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that thing's a three liter bottle. I need to do something with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, so what, one of the one of the other beers I know you wanted to talk about, Graham, um, as well. I'm not going to, I'm still drinking this one, so I might not open it, but I did want to talk about it because I thought it was unique. Uh, before we were chatting, you let us know a little bit about it. And this was the um, Eclectic Electric. So I, I like the name. I'm, I'm a huge fan of funky names, but also it's it's called a New England Saison, but it's not quite a Saison, as, as you said. So do you want to tell me a little bit about this beer um, and the idea behind it? Because I'm, I'm really excited to try it. And I, I think I, I really love the concept that you were going with. Yeah, I, again, along the lines of... Uh giving things a chance and, you know, being experimental yet under some sort of a plan. Uh, I mean, this was, I just gave this right to, uh, my brewer, Justin he had this idea about making essentially, you know, the hazy boy, but fermenting it out with Saison. He's a huge Saison guy. 
and he knows that counter counterpoint is traditionally a big you know hazy ipa juicy ipa brewery so uh he thought he would combine the two and and um this is what he came out with so it was pretty uh you know i, I had full faith in him during the process but on my first sip which you know you'll experience eventually you know completely blew my mind uh it is probably one of the most confusing beers uh, i have tasted um, I like but as you uh, kind of progress through that through that glass that uh you know it, it really grows on you you kind of get the, get the get the gist of, of of what it is and and it truly is yeah we just kind of named it the new england saison right and, what, what are styles anyways anymore so it's um, so true <laughs> yeah, totally with you on yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> some would argue, some would argue, but you know again let's let's keep it fun keep it fresh and this is probably yeah so we i mean tasting this one you know you'll get uh, even right off the bat off the nose you know the, the banana clove saison uh, style of uh, aromatics and then and then it is it's a, it's a juicy a beer with with body like a like hazy hazy ipa so just uh you know we adjusted the, the mash temperature and, and um, the dry hopped the heck out of it as well so what uh I, I don't maybe i missed it did you say what hops you used on this one oh yeah so this one was uh idaho seven and azaka okay cool because i'm sorry you know i i've always been i i'm really excited to try this beer because I'm, I'm a huge fan of banana clove saison like anything belgian just lights my fire so i've always i've always been a fan of belgian ipas as well i've really been a huge fan of them the you know the more bitter so i'm really excited because i think that even the hops that you've selected i think were a little more earthy too and they they i would i, I can just imagine how well they would go with that kind of banana and clove and i i love how you said it's confusing there's nothing better than a beer that's confusing because that is a beer that <laughs> creates complexity for me you know you have to try to figure it out what is that? You know, and you're kind of trying to work your way through it. And like you said, as you said, you get halfway through that glass, and you're like, oh shit, now it's ch slightly changed, especially with Saison yeast, I'm sure, as it warms up, the spices change a little, or I'm really yeah, excited to yeah, try it's, it. It's, it's, it's quite unique. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, it's funny. I mean, there's, yeah, of course, you know, white IPAs or and Belgian IPAs and farmhouse IPAs, but you know, this, we, we found this one just didn't quite fit the bill. So uh, I love it. Yeah, for sure. Something different. And, and, you know, I think that there's a place for a style of beer where you really have to think about it and analyze it. If, again, if you're in that mood and it's, you know, it's intriguing and, and, um, and stimulating, right. In that way, gets your senses going. And, and, and on the other hand, you know, just a, a simple, a simple beer is also nice and, and, uh, serves a purpose. Nice. Now, does that, uh, beer have just as unique a story behind its name as did the Paro Pils? <laughs> Not really. We were working hard to think of something that really suited uh, the beer itself. So it was yeah. just a wild one, kind of, kind of out there. That's cool. I like. I the love name. it. It's hard to pronounce if you're, you know, not careful. Oh, I'm sure yeah. I'd screw it up even saying it twice. I was about to say five times, but <laughs> twice I'd screw that one up. <laughs> I love the experimentation too. So, uh, and you know, trying new things is, you know, I'm huge on it. I think that's one of the it's one of the things I initially, you know, recently wasn't keen on at first on all of the different stuff that was happening, but somebody explained it to me very well. Like, you know, it's innovation and innovation is crazy sometimes. And I love that, you know, you've created this unique beer using a Saison yeast, but that's kind of, you know, haze boy focused, so to speak. Is there a style or something that you would like to maybe crossbreed, so to speak, or cross blend maybe that you haven't, that's kind of been on your radar a little bit? Um, you know, like a, a dunkel, a hazy dunkel or something. <laughs> or maybe a pastry hefe. No, um, we can't so say that anymore, Rob. Oh, okay, joke's sorry, old. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that joke's old now. I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing, uh, to be honest. I, I, I'm actually kind of going, um, I guess, working backwards in that way where I like to get back to, you know, some roots and focus on maybe even having a couple you know steady beers on tap growing our taps as you can see right behind me we, you know we've got four taps so um reserving one or two for uh, you know mainstay would would kind of take up a lot of real estate for you know the fun the fun side of things but i would like to focus and really hone in on on a couple of our beers that that have really been successes and and work through those while we have a, a ton of fun with some other stuff so i don't know i mean again you know we've 
you know, hybrid styles uh, or, or blending styles or crossovers. You know, it's it's tough. I think in, in, unless it happens or unless it just you know comes to mind, that uh, planning it out would be would be pretty pretty tough. Yeah, it's le- less risky when you're a home brewer to try to plan something like that out. <laughs> yeah, I, bet, I mean, again, we've we've you know we've done some some uh, something along those lines, like you know, I mean, dark dark sours are, are not too common, right? And and we've done a couple of those, which have been huge success. Um, mm don't know if i would do anything like a like a stout saison or anything like that <laughs> but, uh, you know dark, i think that's one thing that's underrated uh, dark beers and, and there's a lot of people that have uh just that initial thought that they don't like dark beers but you know there's again there's a huge variety uh of yeah. uh, dark beers and, and, a, and, a, and a range that that you'll find something well you talked to it earlier too about porters even being good you know on a hot day and i could totally agree with you on that like if you get a nice dry porter it's chill by the fire in the middle of july absolutely yeah for sure for sure you drink them cold folks come on (laughs) that's awesome so before i know we're we're getting close to the hour up so we we always like to kind of wrap up with some random questions maybe beer related maybe not be beer related um mine is not going to be beer related what can be maybe a little bit actually it will be i'll change it slightly (laughs) if you could go anywhere in the world right now and drink one beer without worrying about any of the bullshit that's going on where would you go and what beer would you drink and it doesn't have to be your beer it can be like your favorite beer you know it could be a bud light for all i care yeah but please don't let it be a bud light (laughs) (laughs) um man that is a great question but i am not much of a hot weather traveler uh but what i would love to drink is a uh Let's see who's that I have. Oh man, can't remember whose it was, but it was I think it was Parson, one of Parsons from uh, Prince Edward County. Okay. Like the st- they're a stout machine over there, and, and uh, I would love to sit in the Arctic right now and enjoy uh, a rum barrel aged uh, stout. Uh, you know, it is smoking hot out there, humid X all over the place. And uh, you just go for a refreshing beer in a cold on a cold day. That actually does sound wonderful in this heat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you? So the, the su- su- secondary question: Could you supplement that experience by sitting in your beer fridge with a <laughs> rum barrel aged stout <laughs> and put on an Oculus VR set? <laughs> yeah, maybe we could. Try. I'm sure it would have some some positive. <laughs> yeah. That that sounds great, and I love that you said rum barrel aged. Um, I'm a huge fan of rum barrel age and I, we don't see enough of them in my opinion. We see the, so good, many bourbon barrel yeah. age, but I love that you said rum barrel age. Uh, our second round of uh, black is beautiful. will be coming out. should be coming out this fall. So, Oh, perfect. For us is sitting in rum barrel. Love it. And I, I love that you, your, your team is doing a second round too. That's fantastic. Really, yeah, uh, it's, really it's great. A collaboration with a few of our local friends like TWB and short finger block three. And, right. Uh, friend of ours and, it on this one so yeah shout out to ren she's so awesome right. well I'm, I'm looking forward to that i'll definitely have to be making my way down to kitchener as long as there's no roadblocks or anything i'll be heading down for some bourbon rum barrel aged oats yeah we'll keep it open that's for the stuff that's the stuff robin any any random ass question that you're gonna ask graham we used to have a cool yeah. name but random ass question sounds better now i think <laughs> <laughs> the racks um so, <laughs> uh, if there was no limitation graham against brewing equipment ingredients no limitations whatsoever say if you were in like you know the world's biggest brewery shop that gave you anything you wanted what would be the one beer style that you have not yet brewed which you would yeah we haven't brewed a true uh belgian oh i think i I think it would would go a double belgian double um and you know aged for let's say let's say six months right like before even before even thinking about releasing it but, uh or six months or a year but again when it's ready it's ready but you know something that we would brew with the intention of of waiting it out that is wild uh ryan i'm sure you'd love that i know i would heck <laughs> doubles i am a huge fan of doubles absolutely and I, you know I, maybe a quick question one more quick question on the doubles so they are typically bottle conditioned if i'm not mistaken correct so 
we learned from a, a, a visit with reverence on the show that at least I learned, I wasn't familiar with what nails were for testing barrels. So with bottles, are you just essentially just opening one and trying it and, and, and that's kind of your taste test when you're doing a bottle conditioned beer? Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, the, the sacrificial beer to, okay. uh, yeah, to get to the final, final point there where, where it's ready. Um, yeah, just have to crack a bottle and, and test it. Right. So again, it's sort of a patience. How often do you want to, do you want to test it? How, how many bottles are you willing to go through? And, and uh, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't take, you know, too long or else you might be out of beer before you. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> it's not ready yet. It's that, that's the pursuit of perfection that could kill you. <laughs> or at least that bottle selection. Yeah. That's awesome. Be, before we close off, is there anything that, you know, we didn't touch on that maybe you wanted to talk about and, and as well, let everybody know where, where we can find you both in person as well and on Instagram. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you can check us out on uh, at our website on counterpointbrewing.ca. Uh, social media, we're Counterpoint Brewing Co., um yeah myself i'm graham counterpoint on instagram but uh yeah feel free to drop us a line if you have any questions or you know eager to find out about our beer um otherwise we're we're you know uh not far from from downtown kitchener uh, along victoria street and, and frederick street we've got our our tap room and uh, patio which you know again like i said it's, it's fairly small we hold about 30 people uh, seated which is the limitation right now and, and uh yeah we're here we're here otherwise none <laughs> everybody should just know that like you mentioned before you know we, we hold our space and you know in, in high regard specifically for the public and and um in our diverse community that's that's you know in our area um you know we love supporting local businesses and, and also just initiatives that uh that we hold close to our hearts and, and that are meaningful to us Love it. Yeah. Safe space, everybody. If you're listening, that's, you know, counterpoint is, is, is one of those places get down there. And if you can't get down there, you guys deliver beer too. So yeah. get online and you get that fresh bottled a week ago beer delivered to your door. Pretty damn quick too, because it's ICS. People love to hear that too. I, I promise that as <laughs> <laughs> we, well, as a consumer of shipped beer, <laughs> we, we have learned to praise certain shipping companies. <laughs> And, and avoid others and i'm sure as as a business the same goes as well oh yeah for sure yeah yeah you hear the complaints about our beer and like, well when we sent it it was fine so <laughs> yes that was a month ago <laughs> Uh, no that's awesome no you know what we we want to thank you again grant for taking the time to talk to us about counterpoint um you know we, we know being the, the life of a business owner is busy owning a brewery is, is constant work so we really thank you for taking some time out of your day to talk to us about uh, counterpoint and let our listeners hear all about what you got to offer thanks guys i'm super happy to be here and, and uh, yeah to be able to have the opportunity to, to chat it's a pleasure and just stick with us for a sec we'll close up but uh we'll we'll properly wrap up with you after we stop recording here and uh robin any any closing wisdom from robin today uh, no closing wisdom but i'll say it's a, a blast so. to be back and recording <laughs> and uh you know especially to be recording with such an incredible brewery that likes to give back to the community the way that kind of point does so that was awesome yeah awesome I appreciate it we'll see you everybody next week and thank you and happy birthday hip-hop that's happy how we'll birthday. close happy birthday hip-hop <laughs>